Happy Sabbath. I believe God is working through his Holy Spirit. What do you say? I told no one but Elder Wallace this morning the title of my sermon and the song that they just sang, though we had technical, technical difficulties here in it, goes very well with the sermon topic this morning. I can tell a little of the glory of a better word. And if you see me smiling more than usual this morning, it's because God is good. All right. yes, I have been battered and bruised by the enemy for the past couple of weeks, so I'm enjoying a little respite. All right. I thank God for the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. I was struggling this week. Uh, what shall I present? And as I was working on the sermon, I was on the prayer line and uh, their sister was praying and she was choking up. And in the evening at seven, uh, more testimonies that they were feeling down. and despair. And I said, Lord, with all that is going on, the people of God are being dismayed. We have to stay in. We have to wear masks. Our daily routine has been turned upside down. And for many, it's depressing. It's distressing. Many are falling into the state of deep depression. I said to myself, Lord, I have to, I would like to encourage the saints. And so I changed my sermon completely. And this morning, I want to encourage us, beloved friends, by taking our minds from the things around us, to the glories of a better world. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan, then I could tell a little of the glory of a better world. Finite minds cannot fully picture or comprehend heaven, but we can glean what heaven is all about from scripture. And so I encourage you, those who are watching online and those who are here, to be encouraged. Early writings, page 13, paragraph 3, she says, God has shown her the travels of the Advent people to the holy city and the rich reward to be given those who wait the return of their Lord from the wedding. It may be my duty to give you a short sketch of what God has revealed to me. The dear saints have many trials to pass through, like what we are going through now. But beloved friends, she says, but our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, will work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I have tried to bring back a good report and a few grapes from the heavenly Canaan, for which many would stone me as the congregation stoned Caleb and Joshua for their report. She says, I declare to you, my brothers and sisters, in the Lord, it is a goodly land. We are well able to go up and possess it. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Most precious Heavenly Father, I stand in the need of prayer and in the need of divine help today. Dear Lord, what is taking place is bigger than any one man. And so I pray, dear Lord, that you will take full control of my entire being. My thoughts, 
my actions, my hands and my feet, my heart. Put your words in my mouth and use this feeble instrument, O oh Lord, to encourage your people today. Bless someone, Lord, who will be listening in their home on YouTube or on Zoom. Bless those who are gathered here today. And bless the speaker, dear Lord. For indeed, I need your grace. In Jesus' precious name, we ask for the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth as we study your word. Amen. Amen. Now, I like to start with the basics. My topic this morning is heaven. Heaven. And so I will start with the basics. I will ask a few questions. What is heaven? When you go out and you tell people about heaven, they think you're crazy, you're delusional. You've been brainwashed. But let's see from the scripture what God has tell us about heaven. And if you have your Bibles with me, please. Turn with me. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Deuteronomy chapter 26. If you're home on, on Zoom or watching on YouTube, please follow along. Write the text down if you have to and go back and study them and you will be encouraged. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Let's start with the basics. What is heaven? As I go through this presentation this morning, I'll ask a couple questions and then we'll answer them from the scriptures. Amen. What is heaven? Deuteronomy chapter 26. Are you there? Let's look at verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 15. Notice what the Bible says. Look down from where? Thy holy habitation. Where? From heaven. Notice now the Bible says God is in his holy habitation. His holy habitation is in heaven. Your habitat is where you dwell. So, beloved friends, God's dwelling place is in heaven. I want to submit to you this morning that heaven is not a figment of our imagination. Heaven is real. It's a place where God dwells. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Reading from verse 43. Heaven is a place where God dwells. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 8. The Bible says, out of the mouth of the two or three witnesses, let it be established. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 43. The Bible says, hear thou from heaven. What? Thy dwelling place. Heaven is the dwelling place of God. Who is God? Bible says God is love. The Bible says he is the sweet rose of Sharon, the bright and morning star, the one altogether lovely, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. God dwells in heaven. Love dwells in heaven, beloved friends. It is real. It is not a figment of our imagination. God's dwelling place is in heaven. And wherever love is, that's where I want to be. Somebody ought to say amen. The hearts of men are so hard these days that the Bible says the love of many wax cold. But where love is warm, I want to be there. God is in heaven. And beloved friends, whenever we repeat the Lord's Prayer, we acknowledge that God is in heaven. The scripture says, Our Father, who art in where? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And if God has a kingdom, he must have a throne. What do you say? So my next question is, where is God's throne? I told you I'm going to ask a couple questions. We're going to answer them from the scriptures. Psalms chapter 11. Or the 11th division of Psalms. However you want to put it. Psalms chapter 11. Psalms chapter 11. I'm going to read from verse 4. Psalms the 11th chapter and verse 4. If you're there say amen. Where is God's throne? Notice what the Bible says beloved friends. 
Thy, the Lord is where? In his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heavens. Beloved friends, God's throne is in heaven. And what God is doing on his throne in heaven, the last part of that text says, his eyelids behold, and his eyes try the children of men. Beloved friends, if you think you can steal from the church and get away with it, the Bible says God's eyes behold. If you think you can have a relationship on the side and the preacher doesn't know and the church members doesn't know, God beholds from heaven and his eyelids try the children of men. If you can think that you can break any principle on the job to get by, God beholds every action. And when God beholds the action, beloved friends, he says, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. Nobody has to tell God what's going on. He sees all things. And he knows all things. His throne is in the heavens, beloved friends. And the Bible says, his eyes behold. Both the good and the bad. Psalm 53 and verse 2. As we move along. We're going to move from scripture to scripture. Amen. The Bible says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Precept must be upon, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Oh, beloved friends, be encouraged this morning as we talk about heaven, the bright hope of the Christian. Oh, beloved friends, Psalm 53 and verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. God looked down from where? Upon the children of men. To see if there were any that did understand, that did see God. God does not only look for the bad. He is looking to see if we understand his word. He is looking to see, beloved friends, if you and I are seeking him daily. God looks down from heaven. And Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are naked and it is open unto the eyes of him which whom we have to do. Nothing is hid from God's eyes, beloved friends. He sees all things and he knows all things. By, well, we would read the spirit of prophecy says, he not dwell every day as if he was in the presence of God. Everything that he do, though he cannot physically see him with the naked eye, he not know by the eye of faith, God was standing by his side. There is nothing hid from God's throne. Where in heaven is God's throne? See, God's throne is not just in heaven, but there is a particular section in heaven that God's throne is. And so we want to read Isaiah chapter 14. If you can turn your Bibles with me, I'll take my time. I will not rush. I remember the first time I had a speaking engagement. I was moving so fast that the Amtrak train couldn't keep up with me. But I'm going to take my time today. Amen. Isaiah chapter 14. Notice what the Bible says here. Isaiah chapter 14. Where in heaven is God's throne? When the devil was spreading his lies in heaven. To try to take God from his throne. The Bible records that the devil said in his heart. I will, ascend, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Where, beloved friends? In the sides of the north. So God's throne is not just in heaven. God's throne is in heaven, but it is on the north side. And that's very important, beloved friends. If God's throne is so high, we are all the way down here. How can our prayers, uh, can our prayers be answered? Can it be heard by God? Can our prayer be heard by God, beloved friends? I want to submit to you today, yes, your prayer can be heard. Though God's throne is in the north side of the heaven, and we are all the way down here, your prayers can be heard. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and 14 says, If my people who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their what? Wicked ways. God says he will do what? Hear from where? So it does your prayer can be heard? 
Oh, yes, beloved friends. God says your prayer will be heard in heaven. And the only reason why our prayers will not be heard is when we regard iniquity in our hearts. Then God says he will not hear our prayer. I want to submit to you today, this beloved friends, that you have help to bring your prayer up to heaven. The Bible says the Holy Spirit maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So when we pray, beloved friends, the Holy Spirit translates our prayers and bring it up to God as sweet-smelling incense with the merits of Jesus Christ. My wife was reading a book the other day and as she was reading, the author says, as the Spirit translates our prayers and speak with groanings that cannot be uttered. She says, if we hear that prayer, we would not recognize it as our own. Because we know not what we ought to pray for, as we should. The only time God will not hear our prayers is when we regard iniquity in our hearts. The Bible says, but God will hear the prayer of the humble suppliant. Those who are contrite in heart. Of those who are repentive, beloved friends. David said, God, hear my cry and attend unto my prayer. I have sinned and I have acknowledged mine iniquity. My transgression is always before me. David was penitent and he confessed his sins. Jesus, the Bible says, if he confess your sins, he is faithful. And just to do what? Forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God will hear from heaven the humble prayer of the suppliant. Is there more than one heaven? Does the Bible speak of more than one heaven? See, a lot of people have some distorted views of heaven. Some says, when you die, heaven is where you go into a, another form. You will be transformed into a, a lower sphere of existence. Others said that you will die and go straight to heaven. Others have some ridiculous views of heaven. You have some who has so many gods that they say went into the heavens. And so they worship the host of heaven. But is there more than one heaven, beloved friends? Let's answer that question from the Bible. Is there more than one heaven? Yes or no? Yes. Oh, yes. The Bible speaks of three heavens. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We are going to answer that question from the scriptures. Does the Bible speak of more than one heaven? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 2. Paul says, I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Such an one was caught up where? Come on, friends. Are you with me? Are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. Are you there, beloved friends? Oh, beloved friends. And talk to me. Talk back with me. Such an one was caught up where? Into the third heaven. Now, if you have a third heaven, of necessity, you must have a second or a first. Am I right? Oh, yes. The Bible is right, not me. Paul says, Christ was caught up into the third heaven. Now, look at verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise. Beloved friends, according to the Bible, the third heaven is called paradise. You no, know, Brother Scott, I come from a place in Montego Bay called Paradise Heights. 
But it's not that paradise that we are talking about here. Amen. No, sir. Mm -mm. We are talking about the paradise of God in heaven. I know I heard a preacher says, you can, your home can be a little heaven on earth. But if you don't have Christ, your home can also be a hell on earth. He says, if that's the only heaven he will have, then might as well we just pack up and go home. But beloved friends, that's not the heaven that we are talking about today. The heaven we are, the paradise that we are talking about is the paradise of God. Where there is the tree of life, which bear 12 manner of fruits each month. And the Bible says the healing of the tree is for what? The, 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 the leaves of the tree is for the healing of the nations. In that paradise, beloved friends, there is a river of life flowing in the midst of the city from the throne of God, beloved friends. When you drink of that river, the Bible says you will not thirst no more. You know, Thursday evening I was going home and I stopped to buy a jug of uh, coconut water. And we set it in the fridge and let it cool. And then as I poured some in a cup, it was so refreshing. But when I was done with the cup, uh, the thirst came back stronger than before. <laughs> and so I continued to pour. And today it's almost done. So I'm wondering how I'm going to go back to buy more coconut water. But the Bible says when you drink of that river, beloved friends, you thirst no more. As a matter of fact, it says the water shall be in you. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the paradise I want to go. What do you say, beloved friends? Amen. The third heaven is called paradise. But what is the second heaven, beloved friends? The second heaven is called the starry heaven. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3. Let's go there with me very quickly. Psalms chapter 8, reading from verse 3. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3. The second heaven is called the starry heavens. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. So the second heaven is where the moon and the stars are. In Genesis chapter 5, or Genesis 15, chapter uh, verse 5 rather, notice what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5. Genesis 15 and verse 5. God brought Abraham abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. God says, look toward heaven where you see the stars. That's the starry heaven, beloved friends. And chapter 22 and verse 17, the Bible says that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. So where the moon and the stars are, there is the second heaven. Now where is the first heaven? Now go back with me, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and we are going to read verse 8. Genesis chapter 1 verse 8. Are you there? Amen. We're still sleeping. Come on, beloved friends. Genesis 1 verse 8. Are you there? Amen. Now, let me read from verse 6 then. And God said, let there be a, let there be a, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Verse 8, and God called the firmament, and God called the firmament, and the evening and the morning were the what? Look at verse 20 of Genesis chapter 1. 
And God says, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creatures that have life and fowls that they might do what? Fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the first heaven, beloved friends, is the atmospheric heavens where the fowls fly. You know, I looked up something online, National Geographic magazine. It says, we are living at the bottom of an invisible ocean called the atmosphere. A layer of gases surrounding our planet. Nitrogen and oxygen account for 99% of the gases in dry air. With argon, carbon dioxide, helium, neon, and other gases making up a minute portion. Water, vapor, and dust also are part of Earth's atmosphere. Other planets and moons have different atmosphere and some have no atmosphere at all. So the atmospheric uh, heaven is the one where birds fly and the one that has uh, gases. Uh, they call them greenhouse gases. We get oxygen from this atmosphere. It says the atmosphere is so spread out that we barely notice it. Sister Rosa, what happens when you put oxygen into a fire? It ignites the fire, amen? Have you ever wonder why when somebody lights a cigarette, the whole atmosphere doesn't caught on fire? Uh, when we see these uh, wildfires, the whole planet is not on fire. It says the atmosphere is so spread out that we barely notice it. Yet its weight is equal to a layer of water more than 10 meters or 34 feet. Deep covering the entire planet. The atmosphere contains about 98% of its mass. The atmosphere or air is much thinner at high altitudes. There is no atmosphere in space. So, beloved friends, as I was reading that, I think to myself, why then, when fire is lit, that the whole universe does not caught on fire? It says it's so spread out. But the Bible says something very interesting in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to you notice what the apostle says here. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to begin at verse 10. The Bible says, but, at that day and out, but the day of the Lord will so come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and holiness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens shall be on fire. That's not the heaven where God dwells. That's the atmospheric heavens, beloved friends. It shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, we ever wonder why that will happen? The Bible says, the Lord our God is a consuming fire. And when Jesus comes, beloved friends, and he moves through the open space of Orion, and when he gets to Earth's atmosphere, the fire from of the Lord Jesus Christ will ignite the gases that is around in our atmosphere. And the Bible says, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The wicked shall perish, but the righteous shall stand in the fire as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No fire will come on them, beloved friends. They shall meet the Lord in peace. The Lord is a consuming fire. And so when he comes, the atmosphere and the earth shall be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Is there any other beings beside God in heaven? Matthew chapter 24. 
Matthew chapter 24. Let's answer that question. Is there any other beings in heaven besides God? Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. Notice what the Bible says. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Who else are in heaven? Angels. Who are these? Hebrews 1.14 says, These are ministering spirits, sent forth to minister unto them who shall be heirs of salvation. Amen? But we have to know when there's good angels because there are evil spirits out there seeking to destroy us. So we need discernment from the word of God. What do you say? Amen. So angels are in heaven. Where does Jesus go when he ascended? Acts 1 verse 11. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible says, Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. Let me read from verse 10. The Bible says, as the disciples looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gaze up into heaven? For this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into where? Into where? Shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Jesus ascended to heaven at his ascension. So Lord, will human beings get to go to heaven? Yes or no? Yes. The answer is yes. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus had some, of, some human beings up there with him already. Yeah. Hebrews 5, 11 says, verse 5, Enoch, the saint from Adam, yeah. was translated. The Bible says he walked with God and God took him for he was not. Jude 9 says, Moses was resurrected and taken to heaven. Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil for the body of Moses, Doth not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. You see, the devil, his purpose is to keep us here. He doesn't want us to go to heaven. He used to live there, you see, but he cannot go back there, so he doesn't want us to go there. But Jesus says, The Lord rebuke thee. Then you have Elijah, the Tishbite. Fearless and undaunted on Mount Carmel. Through the aid of the God of heaven. Destroyed the false prophets of Baal. Then at the end of his ministry. He begged God to take his life. But God did something better for him. God sent a fiery chariot. Amen. You know when you go on Uber and you can choose your rides. Uber X, Uber Luxury. <laughs> Flaming chariots, beloved friends. God sent for his servant. Elijah is there. And in Matthew chapter 27, 51 to 53, the Bible speaks of those whose graves are open at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he takes some with him as his trophies. Amen. Signifying, beloved friends, that in the last great reaping of the harvest, God has power to take his living saints and he has power to raise the dead and bring them to heaven. Oh, beloved friends, what a hope. Oh, what a hope, beloved friends. So what promise God gave to the disciples back then and to us today? John 1, 14, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told thee. I go and prepare a place for thee. And if I go, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Ask the question, what place then Christ is gone to prepare? What place, beloved friends, Christ is gone to prepare for us in heaven? Hebrews chapter 11. Turn there with me. I, I told you I, I'm going to take my time. We are talking about heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when we are traveling to heaven, we will not be there in just an instant. The Bible says it will be seven days journey. 
when we move throughout Earth's atmosphere and go into the starry heavens, when we pass through the open space of Orion and admire the beauty, beloved friends, of the starry heavens. But one thing I know, that even that beauty cannot be compared with the beauty that is in paradise. And so, beloved friends, I'm going to take my time today. Hebrews chapter 11. What place God hath gone to prepare for his saints? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. Uh, let me read from verse 9. Oh, from verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise. Verse 10, the Bible says, Abraham looked for a what? Which hath foundations, which builder and ruler is God. I want to be in that city, beloved friends. I don't like to be in this city that I'm in. Because in this city that I'm in, have mercy. Contact Tracy. What's that? But in the city of God, we shall be free at last. Free at last, we shall be free at last. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. Look at verse 16 now. But now they desire a what? Better country that is an heavenly. Where God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. God has gone to prepare for you and I a city. Amen. Now we are trying to get out of this city into the country. We don't know how we are going to make it out there. Because we don't have the money. But God says, don't worry. This earth is not your final home. I'm gone to prepare for you a city. Oh, yes. God has gone to prepare for us a city. What is the name of that city, beloved friends, that God is gone to prepare? Paradise? All right. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. The name of the city, beloved friends, is New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is a holy city. Is a what? That city is not like Sodom and Gomorrah. That city is not like Las Vegas. That city is not like New York. God has gone to prepare. Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If you look at the cities today, people are stacked on top of each other. And Jesus says, many mansions in my father's house. I heard a preacher says, there is plenty good room in my father's kingdom. Don't have to worry about stacking on top of each other, Sister Rosa. No, no. We have our own space. Oh, yes. New Jerusalem. Now, how big is this city? If we should have our own space, beloved friends. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 16. Notice now what the Bible said. Are you there? I hear some pitch. I want you to read it with me. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 16. Brother Peter King. The Bible says the city lieth how? And the length is as large as the breadth. And the measure the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. And the length and the breadth and the height are equal. What do you say, Brother Melvin? You want to be in that city? Oh, yes. Amen. 12,000 furlongs. Now, I did some calculation. It says, around the city, it's 12,000 furlongs. But they... Calculate that eight furlongs measures one mile. Wherefore, the city is 1,500 miles all around. 
375 miles that way. 375 miles that way. 375 miles that way and 375 miles that way. The city lies four square. But when you put that into square miles, the New Jerusalem is 281,250 square miles. Now, I, I looked up some of these cities and the square miles of some of them. New York, 54,000. 556 square miles. Georgia, many of us want to go. 59,425 square miles. Tennessee, many of us are already there. 42,181 square miles. Florida, where we live, 65,755 square miles. North Carolina, 53,819 square miles. Add all of that up, it's still not big as the city, New Jerusalem. Oh, beloved friends, there is plenty good room in my father's kingdom. What do you say, beloved friends? There is room enough for you and I. Look at verse 17, Revelation chapter 21. And he measured the wall, thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man that is the angel. Now, when you, when you calculate this, a cubit is 18 inches. So the, the, the height of the wall is 218 feet high. And some historian says the height is simply in proportion with the other measurements. So what is the city of God made out of? Still in Revelation chapter 21. Verse 18. Notice now. The Bible says. The building of the wall. Of it was of what? And the city of pure gold. Like clear glass. Amen. Pastor Shattuck. The walls are made of jasper. No more sheet rock. Amen. Amen. And if your AC breaks down and the time gets hot, it starts to mold. And you have to get out of the house. No more concrete when the time gets hot, very hard to cool down. The Bible says the walls are made of jasper, beloved friends. And the city of pure gold, clear as crystal. Many of us are running down gold here on earth. And the sad story in Africa, millions have lost their lives. Because of precious stones and pearls and golds. Many of these things are called blood diamond. You ever heard about that before? But what men are fighting to put around their necks. God says you will walk on streets of gold. Let's go on. Verse 19. The foundations of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. And the fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardis. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. And the tenth, I can't even pronounce that. But the eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amen. <laughs> and if you go to build a house in Jamaica, you're going to use sand and stone. These stones ain't precious. But God says, the foundation of the city will have these precious stones, beloved friend. Notice, look at verse 21. And there shall be 12 gates of pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city, pure gold, as transparent glass. We are told that when we get over there, we will stand, Sister Martin, we will stand on the sea of glass. With our golden harps. Singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Amen. Over there, I wouldn't have to worry about Brother Peter King. See, you have some gold looking instrument over there. I don't know how to play it, but when I go over there, God's going to give me a harp. Amen. And I'm going to stand on streets of gold and I'm going to play my golden harp alongside my friend, Brother Peter King. What do you say? Amen. God's city is made of gold, stones, precious pearls. We will walk on it. 
One preacher said, God used those things as fittings. We are fighting one another for them today. Oh, beloved friends, we can stretch our imagination to contemplate what heaven is like. But the Bible says, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, neither had entered into the hearts of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So, Lord, who then will go to heaven? Some people say everybody will go to heaven. Doesn't matter how you live on earth. Mm, mercy. If Hitler is going to heaven, then I don't want to be there. It's serious, folks. People are saying that everybody will go to heaven. No matter how wicked you live on earth. You have to ask the question. Then if Hitler is going to be there, what am I doing there? Hitler is trying to take over the world. If he's going to heaven, he's going to try to take over heaven like Lucifer too. He can't go there. Who will go to heaven, beloved friends? Notice what the Bible says in the book of Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Turn there with me. Psalms chapter 37. When you're there, say amen. Psalms 37, verse 29. Psalms chapter 37. God has heaven prepared. For those who will believe and trust in him. For those who will live righteously in this life. Would you say amen? amen? Verse 29 of Psalms chapter 37. The righteous, the who? The who? Shall inherit the land and dwell therein. Thank you sister. Forever. Amen. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein. Notice what the Bible says, Psalms 118, Psalms 118, verse 20, Psalms 118, verse 20. The Bible says, let me read from verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Isaiah 26 and verse 2, the Bible says, open ye the gates. That the righteous nation which keep it the truth may enter in. Who will go to heaven? The righteous beloved friends. Who keep the truth. The Bible says thy word is truth. And thy law is truth. Beloved friends, Revelation 22, 14. The Bible says blessed are they. That do his commandments. That they may have a right. To the tree of life. That they may enter in. Through the gates. Into the city. Oh beloved friends. For without. Who are without? Who are without? And. 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 And whosoever loveth. And maketh a lie. So who will not go? The wicked. The unrighteous, dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Not everyone will go to heaven, but God's will is for everybody to be saved. But unfortunately, not everybody will be saved. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, God will have all men be saved. It's not God's will that people perish. But God says, I sent my son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But this men love darkness rather than light. Men will shut themselves out from heaven. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Who will not go? Notice what the Bible says. Now the works of the flesh. The works of what? Which are these. Now, before I go further. When you read the book of Romans, the Bible says, Ye that are in the flesh cannot please God. We must be in the what? Spirit. 
For if you are in the flesh, you have a carnal mind, and the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. When the mind is carnal, it will be attracted to the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, and these two are similar in some sense, but adultery is having an illicit relationship that somebody who is not your spouse. And if you believe that because you don't physically go out there and do it, but you can cherish it in your mind, you make a sad mistake. Because Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law, I had not known lust, except the law says, thou shalt not covet. The law of God extends even to the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If you cherish this in the heart, you will not go. Fornication. I'm talking to the single people now. Keep yourselves unspotted from the world until God gives you a right partner. Then preacher says, then you can fly. Amen. But you have to keep under subjection the passions of the lower nature. Would you say amen? amen. And not only that, pastor, but fornication extends beyond even that. Uncleanness and lasciviousness. Homosexuality. If you cherish that sin, you will not go. But the beauty about it is God says, if you confess your sins and turn from it, I will cleanse you and I will take you. And there's another one that we hardly talk about. And I want to speak on this the next time, Pastor. There are some who practice self-abuse. In other words, masturbation. And this evil brings disease upon the human body. And the worst thing about it is, it is not confined to teenagers and adults. It is even been practiced by even preteens. I read a book that even a four-year-old learned it from the nurse, developed sickness. And he had to cut it off and the boy begins to be healed. The worst thing is if you don't realize that it's causing your body to be depleted, then you will not say anything. Only the guilty party and God alone knows. And this is eating out the hearts of the brethren in the church, but it is going unnoticed, being swept under the rug. If you practice that, you will not go. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. We see we get quiet when we talk about these things. But if we want to go to heaven, we have to address these things, beloved friends. And let the people know that there is a better way. One that has been ordained by God. We get quiet. We get quiet when we talk about these things. But if you practice these things, you will not go. That is not my sermon, but next time. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go quickly as we are coming to a close. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not go? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21. Back over to Revelation 21. 
Look at verse 27 with me. Let me read verse 25. The Bible says, speaking of the city, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no more night. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Verse 27 says, and there shall in no wise enter into it what? Anything that do what? Defileth neither whatsoever worketh what? Abomination or maketh a but who will be there? They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. I heard the songwriter says, Is my name written there on that page? White and fear. In the book, Sister Wallace, of the kingdom of God, is my name written there. If your name is in the book of life, you will be there. But Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 tells us something. All that dwell on the earth shall worship the beast, the papacy, whose names are not written in the book of life. You will not be there. Revelation chapter 14, verses 8 to 12, the Bible says, if any man worship who? The beast and his what? Image. Or receive his mark in their forehead or in their the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. But I like verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. They will have a right to enter in through the gates of the city, New Jerusalem. Oh, beloved friends. And verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from where? For their works to follow them, they shall rest from their labor, Sister Wallace. So my next question is, are the righteous dead in heaven? When you go to some funeral nowadays and you hear the preacher. John Brown is looking down on us. He's smiling from heaven. But let's ask God from the scriptures, is the righteous dead in heaven? Turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now I'm going to move quickly through some of these verses. John chapter 11. Verse 11, and I'm going to read downward. Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. I may go awake him out of sleep. And the disciples said, Lord, if Lazarus sleeping, he does well. Don't wake him up. You know, I stopped by, I stopped by pastor the other day and his wife was outside. And I, I said, where's the elder? She says, he's sleeping. She said, I'll go wake him up. I said, no, man, leave him alone. Don't wake him up. Let him get some rest. But Jesus says, Lazarus is sleeping. But the disciples thought that he was speaking of Lazarus of taking rest in sleep. But Jesus said in verse 14, Lazarus is what? So Jesus called dead asleep. And when Lazarus was resurrected, he never had any story to tell anybody about him going to heaven. Lazarus was in the grave. Job 7 and verse 9 says, Man go to the grave and he come up no more. Job 14, 14 says he shall wait in the grave until his change comes. Until his what? So the righteous dead are not in heaven. But they are in the grave waiting the resurrection of the just. Is that clear? Amen. They shall wait in the grave until their change comes. So when the righteous dead will go to heaven? John chapter 11, 24. John chapter, let me read from verse 23. Because Jesus said to Martha, thy brother shall rise again. Her reply was, Lord, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection. At when? The last days. So at the last day, the righteous dead will be resurrected and taken to heaven. 
Beloved, it's ama it, it, it amazes me how people want to go to heaven through the portal of death. You want to go to paradise through a medium that is bad. When you look over in Hollywood, when they are going to their uh, awards, they don't just show up in a Toyota or uh, what's the other one called? Hyundai. They show up, beloved friends, in something. Uh, all right, you know what I'm talking about. Why would men and women want to go to heaven through the portal of death? When the Bible says death is an enemy. You know, even when the Bible says we have to die to self. What did he say after, afterwards, beloved? We must rise in newness of life. We don't just die to self and go straight into the other part. No, we must rise. We don't go to heaven through the portal of death. We stay in the grave and God says he will raise us. At the last days. Death is an enemy. And he, he, Cleveland says. You can't dress it up. And some people spend. Hundreds of thousands. On coffins. And in Jamaica they started to build some mini homes. Over the graves. Some even put money in there. I don't know what they're going to use it for. At one point I heard. Some people go and dig up the grave. And steal the money and all the jewels. And everything that was in there. Can't use it. We shall go to heaven not through the portals of death. But we shall be raised, beloved friends, and travel with Christ and the saints throughout the universe, passing the galaxies and the stars, beloved friends. And when we reach at last the gate of the city, some angels will go forward and Jesus will shout, Open ye the gates. That the righteous nation will keep it the truth entering. How will we go? First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us how we will go. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says here. Verse 16. For the Lord himself. Shall descend from heaven with a what? And the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall do what? Be caught up. Beloved friends, you can't travel to Europe. On a Broward County bus ticket. You need a. Plenty. Amen. We shall be caught up. And the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. Where are they going? We are going to heaven. When we get there, we shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. Ella Wallace. Oh, yes. God will give us wings. See little Nathan and Nathaniel flying through the air. Then Sister Tat don't have to worry if they're going to fall. Amen. So when will the change take place before we go to heaven? I'm coming to a close. First Corinthians chapter 15. Notice what the Bible says. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortality shall put on immortality. Then the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, 
Where is thy victory? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We don't want to go into life through the portals of death. Christ will raise us and transform us in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. My, last, my second to last question is, what happens then when we get to heaven? We, we're not going to be idle there, amen? We're not going to be lazy there, amen? Let the Bible tell us what we will do when we get to heaven. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 20, oh, and verse 4. The Bible says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more, no more, no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there any more coronavirus, no more SARS, no more AIDS, no more cancer, no more paralysis, no more, uh, what do you call it, inflammation of the joints, arthritis, amen. No more of that stuff, beloved friends. God shall wipe away all tears, all pain. The former things shall pass away. When we get to heaven, the Bible says we, we are going to enjoy heaven. Walk on the streets of gold. And Jesus will show us the dangers that he has saved us from. We will judge angels. I want to be there. No more pain. Sometimes I have pain in my back, my knee, my belly, my head. All at the same time. Amen. Right, Ella? Yes, Ella. We don't have to. No more pain, Ella. Don't worry about it. No more pain. My last question. Lord. Some say only 144,000 will make it. Is it true? Is there only 144,000 will make it to heaven, friends? Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 14 says, I saw 144,000 stand on the sea of glass. Lord, is there 144,000 only? I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000. Lord, it is there only 144,000. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asa were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. But I thank God that the text didn't stop there. Verse 9 says, after this, I look and below a great multitude which no man can number of all nations, kindred, people, and tongue clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Oh, beloved friends, praise God there will be a great multitude. You can still argue all you want whether the 144,000 is symbolic or literal. The Bible says a great multitude. Someone says, I just want to make it in. Regardless of the number that I'm in. That's why I stand to sing with you today, beloved friends. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. Oh, beloved friends, will you be there? Do you want to go there? I want to go there. 
whether through the 144,000 or of the great multitude, I want to be at that number that goes in the city of God. What do you say, beloved friends? Oh, beloved friends, if you want to be there, stand with me, beloved friends, as we sing together. Let's sing this little verse together and then we close out in prayer. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, I want to be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Amen. I implore you to be encouraged, beloved friends. This world is not our final home. Too much distress and despair. I want to encourage you to lift your mind above what is going on. For the time will come when we shall enjoy the eternal inheritance. May God bless you as we continue to live for him. God be praised. What do you say? Amen. Amen.